So thank you everyone for being here with us. I would like to welcome you to the side event at the Our Oceans Conference, um, Our Ocean Conference, Concrete Solutions for Our Greatest Challenges, Mission Restore Our Ocean and Waters by 2030. And this is organized by the European Commission, the Environmental Defense Fund, and the Blue Mission Med Project, which is a mission project that is supporting the mission objectives, the lighthouse, the Mediterranean lighthouse. And uh, it's also co-led by the Hellenic Center for Marine Research and the National Research Council of Italy. I'm Cristina Deligiani, the Policy and Programs Director at the Institute of uh, Sustainable Development at EPLO, and uh, we have a fully packed program of one hour, uh, too many speakers, no, uh, esteemed speakers today, our award ceremony, we will be talking about the mission Ocean and Waters and why this is important, a flagship initiative by the European Commission uh, f for uh, marine preservation, restoration, conservation, biodiversity. And we have many uh, stakeholders, both for the uh, public and private sector and the philanthropic sector. And with uh, no further um, ado, I would like to um, um, welcome to the stage uh, Mr. Iris Karagiorgis. He is the director of the Institute of Oceanography of the Hellenic Center for Marine Research. Thank you, thank you, Christina, for giving me the opportunity to open uh, our nice side event. And thank you all for being here. It's uh, quite a crowd, that's nice. So, uh, esteemed Mrs. Uh, Vicheva, Mrs. Balti, Mr. Lamy, Mr. Bell, distinguished speakers and esteemed colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to extend my warm welcome to all of you to the 9th Our Ocean Conference side event that focuses on the mission to restore our ocean and waters by 2030. It is an initiative organized by the European Commission and represents uh, a novel, promising and ambitious approach aimed at addressing some of the most pressing challenges concerning the health of our marine environment and the Earth's waters as a whole. The HCMR, which I'm uh, working with, has been involved uh, at the Blue Mission Med, which is a coordinated support action and uh, uh, aims to uh, uh, work on the implementation of the mission and also to foster all the actions of the Mediterranean Lighthouse. And the idea behind it is to engage and mobilize the key actors in order to develop and foster innovations and to deploy concrete solutions at the local level. So I take also this opportunity to thank the Commission for this uh, extremely nice uh, organization and event, and uh, also for spearheading the initiative, which endeavors to transform the, the water as a whole in a better, healthier, more secure, and more sustainable environmental future. The stage of the 9th uh, Ocean Conference, hosted this year in Athens, provides an exceptional platform to showcase the multifaceted achievements of the mission to a broader audience. Here we have all together policy makers and stakeholders that converge to share a common vision and pledge their commitments in order to translate it into action. And this is done by announcing substantial commitments and investing significant resources to unlock the vast potential of our ocean. Thank you very much for giving me the time and I wish you a very fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. And now I invite to take the floor for a keynote speech, Mrs. Charlina Viceva, the Director General for Maritime Affairs and Fisheries from the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, my thanks go to our hosting countries, to our hosts uh, from Greece, always extremely welcoming, uh, great hospitality, uh, well-organized, abundant, tasty food, not the least. Thank you very much for that. And I'm extremely happy to see that we have managed to mobilize so many of you, friends, community of our Mission Ocean, at the very end of the day. So that is indicative, that shows that uh, we are all committed, we have energy to spend on this uh, uh, innovative uh, initiative, uh, the Mission of Ocean and Waters. 
So I'm uh, extremely happy to, to welcome you all uh, on behalf of the European Commission. I'm uh, uh, very happy that we are doing that event together with uh, our lighthouse support for the Mediterranean, uh, but also with the Environment Defense Fund. And I'm extremely happy also to welcome the representatives of the philanthropic community. Welcome on board to the mission. There will be important announcements uh, today, which uh, we are looking forward to very eagerly. Uh, this morning, my commissioner, Commissioner Sinkevichus, was participating in the opening session, and he announced a huge number and, I would say, amount of commitments. Uh, the amount is impressive, 3.5 billion, that will go to uh, healthy oceans. Uh, they will aim at protecting and uh, conservation of uh, our valuable uh, ecosystems, marine ecosystems, but also will promote sustainability, whatever we do at sea. Part of these commitments are related to the Mission Ocean, and we have close to 100 million that we committed this time around to related to Mission Ocean and related to research and innovation. So these 100 million, however, are only the money that we will commit from Horizon Europe. But I will come back to you with the mobilizing effect that we have achieved so far and which brings much more, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of societal energy and commitment to do more for the ocean. What is the idea of uh, Mission Ocean and Waters? It is to achieve a new balance between economic development, between social cohesion and sustainability, and at the same time to do the complex work of addressing the biodiversity loss that we are witnessing and so many times repeating on such events, the pollution that is endangering the ecosystems from collapse, uh, the unsustainable maritime transport. We, were, we are hosted by uh, the, the, the shipbuilding industry of uh, Greece. They're extremely committed to go green, but we should not forget that uh, this sector still is a big polluter at sea. I'm not talking about the Greek one, I'm talking about the global one. So it needs to be addressed appropriately. We still have unsustainable fishing. We in the European Union are trying our utmost with a binding legal fr framework not to allow this to happen, but it is happening still massively around the globe. And I promised to say a couple of words uh, about the latest number, uh, numbers of the mission that though numbers are not always representative of the energy behind, but they are an indicator of how far we went since the beginning of the project. Because the idea of this innovative initiative, initiative is mobilizing, mobilizing the community, mobilizing investments, mobilizing action. So talking about numbers, we have already uh, three working programs of Horizon Europe that delivered. Some of the projects are still ongoing and to be assessed, but it really picked up nicely and we are preparing the fourth program. We have 40 grant agreements and many projects already running. We have over 200 demonstration sites and use cases across the four lighthouses. We have 26 projects coming up a few months from now, once the grant agreements are ready. And we have nicely associated regions. The number is 15, but by the end of the year, we will expect to have 50, 50. So you see the exponential curve on which we are um, uh, riding. And the last but truly really indicative figures are more than 700 actions are pledged on the Charter. Let's remember, we started with the Charter less than two years ago. We announced it at UNOC in Lisbon. And now we have more than 700 and 3.5 billion 
that were triggered and mobilized. So these are indeed figures, but as I've said, the most important is really the community. I all the time see familiar faces, we know each other, we work together, and this is the benefit of having this mission. And I have to say that since we are in the Mediterranean, it is a real front runner, runner among the, the lighthouse projects. But I have to say that all basins are doing remarkable work through research, through innovation, through business activities, engagement campaigns, and more, but also supporting communities across regions, communities that need to enhance their re resilience. These are our coastal communities, our coastal regions, cities, and we want to help them to transition to elevate their sustainability in development. So with this, I would like to welcome you once again. We know that we can't achieve sustainability of the ocean only with what we do in Europe. So that's why we want to go global. And this event, our ocean conference, is the best way to announce our global ambition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would like to invite the uh, chair of the mission board, Mission Ocean and Waters, Mr. Pascal Lamy, to talk about more about the mission and the charter. So, uh, good evening to everybody. Uh, as you may know, uh, the missions have boards. Uh, whose duty is to advise the Commission in the implementation of the mission plans, but also to more generally assess the state of play of missions uh, and build and share a view of uh, whether or not they work. And that's uh, what I'll try to do in the few minutes uh, we have together uh, this evening. In a nutshell, where are we? Five years after the germ of the missions was planted, and the first phase, which was about designing the mission, was started, and as Charlina Vicheva just said, two years after the real start of the implementation of missions. Now, if you had asked me to give you the state of play a year ago, I would have said missions are about a new, innovative, clever, smart combination of ambition and mobilization. And a year ago, I would have said, I'm confident that on ambition, we have scored. And that uh, the target, the objective, the 2030 uh, mission targets will very soon uh, be enshrined in uh, EU law by not just the Commission, who has accepted these targets, uh, but the Parliament on one side and the Council of Ministers on the other side. So on ambition, we're fine. On mobilization, I would have said, mm -mm, not yet there. I would have been rather hesitant, not critical, but to be frank, at that time, the motion has started to appear uh, but not in a very rapid uh, nor dynamic way. Now, a year after, today, with you, uh, there are bad news and good news. The bad news is that on the abention side, whereas the mission have their objectives that have been cleared by the EU Commission, they have not yet been cleared by the Parliament and the Council. Or more precisely, they've been cleared uh, by the Parliament, but we have a serious problem with the Council of
miniatures. In that, the targets for 2030 for protection, restoration of notably the most sensitive parts of our degraded hydrosphere are still floating in limbo. By the way, not because of us, not because of the hydrosphere, but because of the solosphere. The reason why the nature restoration law is still in limbo is because of farmers' protests. I'm not going to give here any political judgment, but it's a reality we have to factor in. For the moment, our objectives are not yet enshrined into EU law, and this is bad news as compared to uh, we, we were expected last year. Now, the good news is that uh, on the mobilization side, things are really, really, really very dynamically moving. Uh, and I'm not saying this just to be nice. I'm saying this because uh, me and my colleagues on the board uh, participate in a lot of local events, and notably uh, here in the Mediterranean, and notably here in Athens at the One Ocean Conference. I've been attending, what, since yesterday, eight or nine events, which are about things getting done on the ground. And I can tell you uh, the dynamic is there. The snowball of uh, groundwork is rolling. And as you know, a snowball that is rolling is getting bigger, and that's exactly uh, what we want to do. I won't uh, insist on the numbers. Uh, Charlina Vicheva just gave a few objective numbers uh, in terms of uh, charters, in terms of uh, programs in the various lighthouses. Just let me, on the financial side, and knowing that a number of you are uh, looking uh, carefully at how they could invest more in the mission. For the moment, the ratio we have uh, between uh, EU money spent and uh, money leverage is one to eight. Not bad, but we probably uh, could do better. Uh, we have uh, a series of indicators that we can show. And finally, uh, we will add to that, and uh, Geneviève Ponce will be talking about this later, uh, this uh, manifesto. Uh, for a uh, European uh, Ocean Pact, which is one of the consequences of the mission, although not officially into uh, the uh, EU Commission system yet, but we believe that the next step uh, should be not only that the Council of Ministers accepts the ambitious targets, and this is an issue about political pressure, my sense being that if we really can be good at showing how the mobilization is working, then this might have a few consequences on the way a number of EU countries will vote in the Council at the next appearance of this nature of restoration law on the agenda. There is, in my view, a connection between mobilization and ambition. It started with ambition necessitating mobilization. We are now at a stage where it's about mobilization, asking for more political determination from a number of our member states. This is politics, I know, uh, but uh, that's where we are. And I'm confident that if we keep demonstrating the results which have started to appear on the ground, and the Mediterranean Lighthouse is obviously, I know the Commission cannot say that, because then people say, oh, the Commission has a bias in favor of the Mediterranean for whatever reason. I can tell you my own sense, what I get, is that the Mediterranean Lighthouse, this place, is the most active of all. It may be because the Mediterranean is in a worse sta space or stage than uh, the Atlantic or the Baltic or the Red Sea, maybe. Uh, but I can tell you what you're doing here is really, really impressive. So let's keep in this direction. Thanks for your attention.
Thank you very much. And now we'll be having our panel discussion on aligning philanthropic and public investments for island transitions. We have a group of esteemed speakers with us representing various stakeholder groups. And um, I would like to call to the stage Mrs. Mara Antoniadis, the mandated regional councillor and president of the Development Agency of the South Aegean Region. And as I'm uh, asking uh, speakers to come and sit uh, with us, um, there's a slide over there, as you can see, uh, a QR code, uh, start uh, using the quiz. Uh, Mr. Chuck Fox, the Executive Director of Oceans 5, if you can join us, please. Uh, Senator, the Honorable Matthew Samuda, Minister Without Portfolio, Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation of Jamaica and a Global Island Partnership Collaborator. Thank you so much uh, for being with us. And um, uh, Ms. Kate Bonzon, uh, Vice President Fisheries and uh, Oceans Environmental Defense Fund. So the very first question is, which SDG is the most underfunded? Is it SDG 1, no poverty? SDG 12, sustainable consumption and production? SDG 13, climate action? Or SDG 14, life below water? What do you think? Well, uh, have you? Okay, yes, it is. SDG 14, life below water, uh, is the most um, underfunded SDG. And there's an, a second question, if we can have that, please. So the investment gap to achieve the SDGs by 2030 is approximately 1 trillion euros, 10 trillion euros, 14 trillion euros, or 30 trillion euros. What do you think? Well, it's actually 30 trillion euros by 2030. It's a lot of money, a lot of uh, financing that is needed, both from, uh, well, from all sectors of the economy, from all um, donors, the private, the public sector that need to invest. And without further ado, let's go to our uh, panel to address all these questions. So, uh, Ms. Mara Doniaz, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do, uh, your everyday work at the region of the South Aegean? Hello. Is my mic okay? I assume yes. Good evening to everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I am very honored to be here with you among your estimated guests. I, represent, I will be representing here the governor of South Aegean, Mr. Yorgos Hadzimarkos. I myself am a councillor of the South Aegean region and I'm also the president of the development agency of the South Aegean, which is called Red the Same. And I'm also a lawyer. Um, I will be taking you with me through some details regarding our islands and our region. The South Aegean region um, is a region that consists of 52 small and bigger islands that are currently inhabited. And it is separated into uh, different prefectures. The first of them is the prefecture of the Deccanis that, that has capital the island of Rhodes, which is also the largest from the islands of the region and where I come from. And uh, the second is the prefecture of Cyclades with capital the island of Syros. But I assume most of you would be more familiar with the island of Mykonos or with the island of Sandorilni that are uh, very great touristic destinations. Uh, we have also, um, during the winter time, uh, permanent population around uh, 310,000 people, but this is a number that uh, during the summer season uh, multiplies itself uh, due to the tourism, of course. Due to the tourism, we face uh, the problem of overpopulation that, uh, of course, uh, very quickly made us um, to acknowledge the needs that in order to maintain the quality of life 
for both our visitors and for our permanent residents, we had to go very seriously into the business of uh, green and blue transition. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Ch uh, Chuck Fox from Oceans 5. Um, thank you. Um, first, I wanted to say thank you to the Commission and to John and Charlena, and I don't think we'd be here were it not for Pascal. Um, thank you for your leadership. Um, I represent a, a group of philanthropies called Oceans 5, and we are 25 of the world's leading philanthropists from the United States and Europe. Um, we have focused uh, very heavily on marine protected areas, fisheries conservation, illegal fishing, and recently on ocean and climate um, interactions and, and how we can collectively stop the climate crisis. Um, private philanthropy is really only a small contributor to the solutions that we all share and the goals that we all have. And the reason I'm here and the reason we are so enthusiastic about this is because working together with government, we can create a private-public partnership that in fact can have a really big impact on communities, not just in the European Union, um, but throughout. Uh, we have made grants throughout the European Union for 14 years on these subjects. Uh, we find it uh, best when we can work closely with governments that are showing leadership. Uh, we have seen that in the European Union generally on issues like decarbonizing shipping and the Green Deal. It's really a globally significant, remarkable leadership position. The EU was similarly inclined on IUU fishing, and we are seeing some opportunities here in, within Mission Ocean uh, with governments like Greece. Um, in the case of some marine protected areas, we've heard the Prime Minister talk about this. Um, Spain in the, um, in the Canary Islands, Portugal in the Azores, and we're very optimistic and hopeful that we can leverage private philanthropy to work with government and to really make some significant accomplishments on behalf of the oceans. Thank you. And uh, Senator, the Honorable Matthew Samuda, uh, you, you came from Jamaica all the way to Greece, and thank you for that. And thank you for having me, and uh, I, I want to also thank Greece for hosting us, first of all, and, and thank you for this opportunity to participate in the side event. Uh, I'm a senator in the Jamaican parliament, and I have ministerial authority for water, environment, climate change, and indeed developing our blue economy strategy. And as a small island developing state, we, we share um, unequally in many of the development challenges that all of our brother and sister nations do. We are on the front lines of facing the triple planetary crisis and all the factors that lead into that. Now, we are a large ocean state, albeit a small landmass. Our EEZ is approximately 24 times our landmass. And admittedly, we've never been able to leverage the true value of this awesome um, blue asset that we, that we have. And because of, I think, negative public policy um, in the past, we are, you know, not, we're not able to benefit from the sort of pristine, awesome um, value that it would have had 30, 40 years ago, because ultimately we are seeing the impacts of climate change. We are seeing biodiversity decline in our, in our waters. So it's at the time when you finally realize from a public policy standpoint what you truly have, you must um, invest so heavily in restoration and preservation of it in its current form. So I think this conference and this side event provide the opportunity to create the foundations of a, a true partnership to make SDG 14 a, a touchable, realizable um, goal. Um, that partnership has to include nation states, multilaterals, um, academia, um, Philanthropic, philanthropic organizations, but I think there's a genuine opportunity here. And as we move towards our 2030 goals, we're, we're happy to be able to participate and, and ensure that we are part of that partnership. Thank you. Um, Greece is also an, an island state. We have so many islands, both habited and uninhabited, and a notion of opportunities there. So uh, I feel what you say about the biodiversity loss, the impact, the negative impact of climate change. Um, um, we feel that in Greece too. And uh, Mrs. Bonson uh, from EDF, um, a co-organizer of today's uh, event. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Very nice to be here. Good to see you all. Thanks for joining us at the end of the day. Um, so I, as um, she said, I'm Vice President for Climate Resilient Fisheries and Oceans at Environmental Defense Fund. Uh, EDF is a, 
nonprofit, and we really focus on stabilizing the climate, strengthening, strengthening the ability for people in nature to thrive, and supporting people's health. And in the fisheries and oceans work, we really take a partnership approach to driving resilience for both ocean ecosystems, but also the communities that depend on them. We are primarily focused on fisheries and really ensuring we have sustainable food systems, um, but also on livelihoods and ensuring that communities um, can really have the support they need in doing the right thing for the environment. We are also increasingly looking at the ocean climate nexus, both in terms of its mitigation and adaptation approaches. And we really work closely with both communities and governments to ensure that we have the right policies in place, the right tested solutions in place, and the right financing in place to drive a change on the ground. And all of that is really driven by a coalition of engaged champions that include stakeholders, scientists, and all the rest. So I'm really pleased to be part of this um, integrated conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. And um, Mrs. Adoniadis, back to you. And the South Aegean region uh, has hosts almost the one quarter of the tourism in Greece. So uh, islands that are very popular like Mykonos, Rhodes, Kos, uh, there's a lot of challenge and a lot of burden when it comes to infrastructure, when it comes to ecosystems, when it comes to biodiversity. Uh, but also the, um, the region is a champion of the green and blue transition. So what are the initiatives, what are the actions that you have implemented towards that direction given that you have so many, such a burden uh, because of tourism? Thank you for the question. In the South Aegean region, we work with a very clear goal, to be worthy of the next generation to come. And keeping this in mind, um, together with the fact that each and every island, as you very correct said, is a different and unique ecosystem, we've implemented a series of different projects that um, are able to be copy-pasted in other regions too and in other islands and all related to the green and blue transition. Rising up uh, to the challenge of our times, we um, recognized uh, that uh, we need the clean energy now more than ever and of course the preservation of our environment. Of course, uh, we also acknowledge very quickly that this is a very hard task to do and uh, we couldn't do it alone, nor should we do it alone. In the South Aegean region, we care very much about the goals we set, but also we care about how we get there and with who we get there. And um, this is why the South Aegean region might be among uh, the first administrative units of Greece that uh, have taken the leap and um, uh, tried to overcome the narrow boundaries of the public sector and be able to join their ventures with uh, the private sector in order to be more quick and more efficient to their pro projects. We have, um, with uh, using the force of the synergies, we've um, achieved uh, to make reality some green projects, which we're quite proud of. One of them is the project uh, of Halki. Halki is a small island of, in the Deccanis, and with the help of the Greek government, uh, has turned into an island uh, with, uh, that is autonomous uh, in clean energy and also has a um, zero carbon footprint. This project has already been announced by the Prime Minister of Greece that will be funded in order to be, re to be replicated in other islands too. Another very interesting project of ours is the project of Tilos Island, which is also a small island. And um, our project there is uh, called the uh, Tilos Just Go Zero. Uh, the economy there um, we, we've uh, accomplished uh, to be centered uh, in the um, uh, circular economy. And uh, we've managed to minimize the waste that is producted and we have a very big amount of waste percentage uh, above 90% that is being recycled in Tilos. 
Uh, it has also been announced, announced I think, the previous week uh, from the Prime Minister in his uh, visit in Tilos um, that he intends to replicate the project in, uh, of Tilos in other islands too. And last but not least, and I, I also say the governor of the South region, and we welcome him too in our, uh, in our audience. Hello. So, last but not least, um, I, I have to announce a big project of ours uh, that is called the Roads Collab Project. It is a very nice synergy between the private and the public sector. Uh, it is a project of our region combined uh, with the municipality of Rhodes and the TUI group that aims to um, uh, transform the island into the first sustainable holistic uh, de destination, touristical destination. As you can assume, this is a very challenging project mm -hmm. given that the island is very big, perhaps the third in Greece. So, so, so many partnerships, and you're also signatories of the Mission Ocean, and we're very proud of that. One of the first uh, regions in Greece, actually the first that is a signatory of the mission, and we have to do, you know, thank you and congratulate you on this. And with that, um, Mr. Mrs. Uh, Bonzon, uh, EDF is also working with the mission, like the region of South Aegean. So, how is EDF working with the mission? How are you contributing to the green transition and the? EU? EU Green Deal. Thank you so much. Yes, we're also very proud to be a signatory to the Mission Charter. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to share three quick examples. So one is in Spain and Portugal, where we have um, partnered both with local communities on the ground and other NGOs to create co-management entities for fisheries and MPAs, where communities and governments are working together in order to manage marine waters in a collective way. Um, and we've done quite a bit of um, science and technical support, ensuring that they um, can really take the data that they have and turn it into action and management plans for their fisheries and MPAs. I also wanted to go uh, across the Atlantic to um, Senator Samuda's uh, general region um, to Cuba. We um, have worked for many years in Cuba, and most recently we helped uh, local scientists organize and um, conduct a circumnavigation of Cuba as a scientific research. We call it the El Bojeo, and they've been collecting scientific data. It's, it's still so early that they're um, analyzing all of that data, but they did find some really interesting things, including that um, uh, ocean temperatures were much higher than they had expected in some places, and that while some coral reefs were certainly showing um, stress from some of the heat. There were others that were showing um, quite a bit of health and resilience. So I think a mixed bag, but will be really interesting to see as the papers come out from that um, expedition. And then the third thing I wanted to mention, which is um, uh, kind of slightly unrelated, is um, in Puerto Rico, we have been partnering with local communities that there to really help them um, ensure their long-term resilience, especially after big ocean events like hurricanes. And um, they have um, really been focused on an energy transition to um, create more renewable energies, but also that is disconnected from the grid and more localized so that they can have energy, uh, much more sustainable and stable and resilient energy. Um, and we've been working in a number of communities there to really bring that to fruition. Um, so I just, I noted that uh, Director General Vicheva had mentioned that, you know, there's an interest in not just the EU waters, but also beyond. So wanted to share a few examples there. So uh, this is great from tiny islands in Greece to Spain, Portugal, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and back in Jamaica. So what are some of the best practices that you can share with us as regards um, re building resilient, sustainable island communities? And what are some tips and how can we actually overcome potential political um, or um, um, bottlenecks that come from uh, local communities as well? Yes, Senator Samuda. Just making sure. No, um, you know, I, we're happy to be, uh, you know, ambassadorial in, in a sense of the Global Island Partnership. And um, one of the tenets of that partnership is that we believe the solutions can indeed come from our citizens and come in, can indeed come from our political processes. Um, we've operated under a 
philosophical umbrella that prosperity cannot be steeped in pollution and that environment, rather that economic development cannot come on the back of environmental degradation. And I think that's a philosophical underpinning in terms of how we have engaged our society over the last 10 years that development truly has to be sustainable. Now, with that, that has given us the having that conversation and having that open dialogue, not always the easiest dialogue, but certainly by bringing in civil society, by bringing in academia and ensuring that they're always at the table with local communities, we've been able to um, be rather progressive in several of our initiatives, some that persons thought would have been very difficult. One that we believe that has been particularly um, positive, we would have been the, the, the first in the Caribbean to start our phased ban on single-use plastics. So. In 2018, we started the process on, we removed styrofoam from our waste stream, we removed plastic bags, we removed plastic straws. This year, we expect to remove uh, microplastics from uh, personal care products and look to remove plastic lunch boxes. We've also set some particularly ambitious targets as we try to develop the circular economy, not just in the area of plastics, but generally, but certainly with plastics, which is the elephant in the, the room we have ensured that we have set a 70% recycling target, right about 32% now, which is relatively high regionally. But the core, the core pillar is that you won't achieve any of your environmental goals, whether it is targeting um, the emissions cuts that you need to, to reduce your, your impact in climate change, or you want to reduce your, your, your footprint as it relates to pollution, whether plastics are, are otherwise, without bringing society along and I think um, that has to start with a robust public education program and we shouldn't be shy to start as early as a primary um, education um, category and work our way straight through with environmental clubs and with community engagement. So community engagement, education, policies, um, circular economy models, all these need money, financing. So uh, Mr. Cha, uh, Mr. Uh, Fox, so how can we uh, leverage, how can we mobilize um, additional funds to implement the mission, to uh, work towards SDG 14, and what does um, Oceans 5 have to uh, contribute towards that direction? Private philanthropy is um, often looked at as the solution for everything. Uh, we're considered by some people free money. Um, if you're in the European Parliament, you don't have to go through any processes. In theory, you come to private philanthropy and people think we just have all this money to give away. Um, the reality is that private philanthropy is good at some things, but not at others. You can imagine that you know, we don't do waste management projects, infrastructure, roads. That's, not, that's an inherently governmental function that private philanthropy is not particularly good at. What we can be good at is curating ideas that hopefully change the world in the future. And to give you a couple of examples of this, you know, we fund, we fund civil society that tends to get involved in the political process, that tends to develop ideas that are often uh, steeped in science, um, that then they can present to elected officials and appointed officials and make a difference. Uh, we have funded groups in the Mediterranean, for example, working at the Med Sea Alliance and Global Fishing Watch to stop bottom trawling in marine protected areas. It's, it's a uniquely European phenomenon that this happens. Uh, the Prime Minister of Greece is announcing a commitment to stop that, and that is a remarkable commitment that has grown out of, I would argue, civil society and academia making the case that this is not consistent with a marine protected area. Uh, we have funded some groups here in Greece, um, groups like WWF uh, Greece, groups like Greenpeace in Greece. They've worked on marine protected areas in the Ionian Sea and the Aegean Sea, and these are some of the leaders that are intellectual leaders in advancing policy policy in the future. And, and this tends to be a very productive role for private philanthropy. Um, you, you can't always win. You, you have to have a, aligned elected officials like the senator here that are willing to work or aligned leaders within the commission. But this is, a, I think, a perfect role for private philanthropy. And what I, I, I keep take away from this panel is partnerships. This is partnerships, philanthropy, civil society, academia, um, public and private partnerships. This is uh, what the key takeaway is, at least for me. And uh, it, it's also important 
to, to stress the work that can be done between the philanthropy sector, uh, civil society, and governments towards uh, achieving SDG 14. Thank you so much for your insights and sharing your, um, your views on this topic. And um, as I will be welcoming very, very soon um, the award winners, I would like to thank you and um, we will be seeing you later at the cocktail reception after this uh, event. Thank you very much. And just before the por uh, Blue Ports and Destination Awards, we have a, uh, a last uh, slider question. As I um, actually asked to come uh, to the stage, uh, Mrs. Vicheva. Mr. John Bell um, and Mr. Pascal Lamy. So, these are, uh, this is an award ceremony, uh, Blue Ports and Destination Awards by Blue Mission MED and curated by the MED Cruise Association. The awards have been launched as part of an, um, a series of engagement activities of the Coordination Support Action for the Mission Mediterranean Lighthouse, Blue Mission MED in cooperation with MED Cruise, as I said, which is a partner of the uh, Blue Mission MED. And with uh, no further ado, I would like to um, uh, present an award the award of the category one, building design, construction, or technical sustainability solutions to the port of Antwerp, Bruges. <laughs> Thank you so much. Congratulations, Sari Norda, for you and the port. The port has been recognized for its commitment to sustainability across all operations. Notable initiatives include proactive dog water level management, collaboration for uh, water conservation measures to enhance water quality and biodiversity. And I invite you to stay on stage. Water and is vital to the port. Sounds let us logical. watch a because short video. Water, ships cannot sail, but there is more. Climate change increases the risk of droughts and floods. This has an impact on shipping and industry, but also on nature and the environment. It is therefore in everyone's interest that our port has sufficient clean water. But how does Port of Antwerp Bruges strive for clean water in the port? We clean the riverbed and the docks by dredging up historically contaminated sludge. An installation cleans the silt and filters the wastewater. The clean water then flows back into the docks. To remove waste from the water, we have grab cranes, a waste collection boat, and an innovative plastic catcher. But drones and smart cameras also help in the search for floating debris. And with smart water sensors, we continuously measure the quality of the water to quickly detect and solve causes of pollution. In addition to filtering and purifying, we are also actively engaged in stimulating and protecting life in the water for example, we scour smooth key walls, thus attracting small aquatic animals, which in turn are food for the fish. Thanks to the creation of a spawning zone, these fish can lay their eggs undisturbed in a safe place. And further research into underwater fauna, such as shrimp, worms, and snails, allows us to take targeted action to improve biodiversity. Biodiversity and clean water go hand in hand with a stable water level. But climate change is creating major challenges here. In Antwerp, we are carrying out tests to pump water from the Scheldt into the docks during extreme droughts. In Antwerp and Bruges, water can flow from the River Scheldt and the sea to the inner port through canals at high tide. And we encourage companies to maximize their use of circular water. Via the Water React tool, for example, we support companies in planning this. We are testing how we can collect use and infiltrate as much rainwater as possible. Because one thing is certain, water is vital to the port. Congratulations again and category number two, social corporate responsibility and community and port connectivity. The award will be given by John Bell, the deputy mission manager and director of Healthy Planet DG, research and innovation of the uh, European Commission. And the award goes to the port of Ravenna, Bravo. 
So the Port of Ravenna is acknowledged for visionary strategies supporting the city's great transition. If you'd like to, to be on stage, uh, the key activities are development of a green port, an energy hub, creation of a maritime park, the focus on sustainable mobility initiatives. And let's go to our third category. The third category is eco-conscious entrepreneur and personality, and we have two winners. Uh, Will, the Port of Heraklion, and <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Minas Papadakis will receive the award uh, by Mr. Pascal Lamy, and the uh, Galata Ports in Istanbul. <laughs> so... Both winners for the vision of, um, of the um, governance team and also for the team structure that they have. Congratulations. And um, we can, you can all stay on, on stage so we can take a photo. But we also have a flag here. A really, really nice flag. I would also um, ask Mrs. Fedra. Frank Conchi, the coordinator of the Mission Blue, uh, and Afigena Yan, president of the Med Cruise, to be in the picture with the four winners. Let me, let me help you. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. In Greece, we say, say feta cheese. Congratulations again. We're, we're done. Great. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I would like to invite Mrs. Geneviève Pons, the Director General and Vice President of Europe, Jacques Delors, for an, a really nice announcement. There's a manifesto. Thank you, Christina. So, um, well, I am part of this uh, mission from the start, from 2019, 2019. And, um, and uh, I must say I am impressed by not only the conception, the ambition, but also now the realizations. And in the, in, in the, the same direction, we want to continue. So we want the next uh, EU institutions to be inspired by this mission and to put on what is already a, an ocean union, an ocean strategy. I look at my friend John Bell because he's uh, probably uh, the author of this uh, formula. So very rapidly, what it is, uh, who is it? And when will it be officially launched in Brussels? So uh, what it is, it is really a plea for the next EU institutions to adopt the philosophy of starfish, a holistic strategy for the ocean, for a healthy and thriving ocean, for a protected, restored ocean, but also for a sustainable blue economy. The, 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 the central aim and the five branches are more or less the one of the starfish. That's for what, who. So we are a group of stakeholders who are very often part of the EU mission. So the co-creators uh, of this idea are Europe Jacques Delors and uh, Océano Azul, involved in the mission from the start. And uh, very high level stakeholders, very much involved in ocean protection, like former commissioners, uh, Mrs. Damanaki, uh, Mr. Uh, Vela, um, and, and also MEPs like, like Catherine Chabot, former ministers, including Greek, uh, like our friend uh, Spiros uh, Kouvelis. So this is uh, what we, uh, who we are. And finally, when keep the date of tomorrow in mind, because tomorrow in Brussels, together with Catherine Chabot, Europe Jacques Delors and Océano Azul, 
will launch uh, this manifesto to inspire the uh, next uh, EU institution, next parliament, next commission, next council. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it's um, a great pleasure to invite for the closing session Mr. John Bell and remind you that there, there will be a networking cocktail after this uh, session outside at the foyer. Uh, Christina, uh, in Ireland, the, the person who gets between you and your cocktail is normally called a barman. Um, so I'll do my best to keep you and your hope alive of getting a free drink at least out of this extraordinary experience. Um, I think to go back to what, uh, what Pascal was saying at the beginning, and what we were told at the end uh, by Genevieve, we're in this very important political moment where we need to restore people's belief in restoration. That restoration is for people and communities and islands and fisheries and ports and real places where real people who are not members of elites live their lives, that it's not something to be divided about. And that is why what we're doing at this phase of the mission, showing and telling in real places, scaling things up, we'll have more than 100 communities who will be supported in developing their transition plans, ready to work with partners like our partners uh, and future partners in philanthropy, in banking, uh, in, in regional and national and local level, to restore the society and the way of life that we want. That's what the end this is about. It's about where we live and how we want to live and in what way we want to live. Um, the mission in the middle of all of this is a mobilization, a movement, as Charlena was saying. It's not about science projects. It's about putting the knowledge and the solutions in the hands of communities so they can work out in new ways the decisions that need to be made about where they live and how they work and where the next generation will live. The next generation, this is part of a generational commitment we have, and the next generation coming through are anxious and wondering what we're going to do. So anxiety is not a policy, and the mission is about bringing generations together to show that we can actually restore the places that we depend on, live in, uh, recreate by, are healed by, and are restored by. We're moving now in the mission to the next phase, as Pascal said, we've had the start-up, and now we're moving to the scale-up, the deployment, the mobilization, more than 700 groups already in the charter, billions of euros in commitments, political interest in the institutions at national and regional level. I was very struck uh, by what you were saying earlier on uh, about the, the, the South Aegean region, real places that need to be enabled, supported, and to show, you said copy and paste, wouldn't we love to be able to copy and paste some of the work that you're doing in the South Aegean, uh, Paros, by the way, is my favorite place outside of Ireland. Um, but to actually show and tell that this can be done, restoring people's faith in restoration. We've got this. This can be done. This is not beyond uh, our, our opportunity to do this. So the missions are also there to try and restore the ambition that Pascal spoke about is a practical thing. It's showing people how to do it. So we need to move this mobilization out from the initial communities who were funded. We need to work with our partners uh, in Philanthropy. We had a, a terrific meeting this morning with our colleagues in Ocean 5 and the EDF. I see Gerald was even making a, a high-level visit there earlier on as well. But now we need to get things done together in our different ways. Uh, and we need to do it in a way that by the time we get to Nice next year, and I'm hoping we're all going to be oceaned out by Nice next year, we'll have done so much and got so much moving forward, that we'll start to see what does restoration and resilience look like in islands, in large MPAs, in, in seafront and waterfront cities, in ports and so forth. In the Med, of course, our Mare Nostrum, that's the Latin for our sea, our inner sea, it's special to us in the European Union. We need to put, as I said last week, more Nostrum back into our Mare. It needs to become our, ocean, our sea, uh, the basis of our way of life, and knowledge is part of that. So I invite you, we've spent more than 400 million euros in the pipeline of this mission. Uh, we have an extraordinary array of supports and projects. It's not just the traditional scientific projects which are important in themselves to found things, but as, as Charlene said, there's associated regions, there are supports to communities. We can build pilots in each of the four lighthouse regions. And one of the ambitions we have with the other work that we do with our partners in the Atlantic 
uh, the Atlantic uh, Ocean Research Alliance, pole to pole, coast to coast, is to start maybe working with our colleagues in the Caribbean and in other parts uh, to take things forward and to share uh, the hope and the practice. Um, to conclude, 2030 is really a state of mind. It isn't really a date. The urgency bit tends to get missed uh, in the kind of the burnout of the, uh, the knowledge and the hope that we get in these events. We're running out of time. We're not running out of ideas. We're not running out of political will, despite what you see in here sometimes in the confusosphere uh, up there. And what people need to see, they need show and tell, they need scale, they need turning optimism the hope through real plans, real projects, real communities. So here, I invite you as I did last week in Barcelona, I think it was Barcelona last week, um, and uh, what we're inviting you to, can we build 100 resilient coastal communities by the end of the decade? Actually build them, not talk about them, but do them, whatever they are, whatever community is, a bunch of islands here or there, waterfront cities, port cities. We talked Antwerp, Antwerp Brugge, Galata Port, uh, Heraklion, Ravenna, this is happening already, but can we do that in a way that it can be scaled by those who bring in the big money, the wall of money that's there, the trillions of money that people are waiting to use intelligently, and reassure people uh, that in the end of the day, in this, what Senator Kerry said this morning, you know, this race against time and tide, that better is possible, better is available, better is overdue. So let's restore our faith in restoration and get on with this ocean sea of ours and make it better for one and all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I would also like to, to thank the audience. It's uh, at the very end of a very long day. So I would like to invite you to join us at the networking cocktail. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.